Hello everyone! My name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all. Today we're going to be talking about an oldie but a goodie. 24-7 pet play and I last talked about this six years ago on my channel. I have been doing YouTube for a very long time now, but I wanted to revisit it because I just have so much more knowledge and experience and new ideas that I wanted to share. And I also want to just reapproach this from the context of knowing more about what pet play is, different approaches to 24-7 and all of that good stuff. So if you want to learn about that, you are in the right place and we'll get started. So if you know anything about me or my channel, you likely know that for me, pet play was really my gateway into BDSM. And as soon as I learned about what pet play was, I was like, yes, I want to do this. I want to do this kind of relationship this way. And I had like one or two days where I thought maybe I was a kitten because everyone I saw was doing kitten play. But then I quickly discovered, no, I actually want to be a puppy because I really, really like dogs. And also I'm allergic to cats. So wouldn't that be kind of ironic? But I got into pet play. It was like the first thing I ever did within BDSM. And it really compelled me to get out there and join a community and learn about this more. And frankly, without pet play, I don't know if I would be doing this as my job right now. So I think that's pretty cool. But when I was getting into pet play, I feel like we were very much in a transition moment between two different ways of thinking about pet play, especially as part of a power exchange relationship. You had this one older and less prominent these days, but definitely very respected way of doing pet play that was very disciplined, very high level and seen as sort of old school and like the right proper way to do it. And then you had this newer version that was emerging that was much more aesthetic and newbie friendly and just more welcoming, definitely still pet play, but two very different ways of going about it. And so I want to discuss those two different ways of approaching pet play and how they inform the way you do a 24 seven relationship like this. But before I do that, I feel like I first need to define what pet play is in case this is somehow your first video you've ever seen about this. And essentially what pet play is, is it is a form of consensual BDSM role play that is done where one person is taking on the role of the pet at least. Sometimes both people or multiple people in a scene are the pet, but the most traditional way of doing this is typically where the S type is the pet and the D type is some kind of master, owner, trainer, etc. Or you will also have people who are what is called a solo pet, where they do pet play on their own alone or in groups with other pets without a power exchange component. Pets come in so many different varieties and types and everything else, you will have pets who are dominant, you will have pets that are switches, you will have pets that are polyamorous or monogamous or a bunch of other things. And you don't have to just be a pet that resembles the kind of pet you would have in real life, you can't have a pet that is any kind of animal. A lot of pets are, of course, ponies, kittens, puppies, pigs, cows, bunny rabbits too as well. But you can also be things like a raccoon, a dragon, a mermaid, some kind of hybrid creature, a wolf. Lots of other options are popular as well. And from the very first time I was ever introduced to BDSM at all really, and also pet play, I knew people that were approaching this with those different identities that weren't necessarily just like, pony and kitten and puppy. Like you could be lots of different things and also still call it pet play. But the core idea is you are taking on the role of a pet in some fashion and that is what is informing your role play. But there are, as I've already said, 
definitely very different ways of going about it and it is very commonly associated with power exchange to the point that many people do define it based on it being a flavor of a DS relationship. I don't think it has to be that way, but for the sake of this video, it probably does. I will just assume that power exchange is going to be part of what is going on. Now, going back in time a little bit, I wanna talk about what I see as the traditional way of engaging in pet play and how that informs what people are doing. And this was sort of nerve wracking for me when I was first researching anything about pet play and kink because the version that you will see with this is typically more extreme, more hardcore. The pet play isn't just like, la la la, it's like happy to be a pet and I like getting to play around and be silly. Like it's typically very serious. It's very much uh, you are being humiliated and degraded and it is humiliating for you as the submissive or the slave to be put into the position of being like an animal. And so you get this mentality of the pet not necessarily being this like treasured, precious object that is like the center of affection for the partner, but it's almost sort of more like an early 19th or 18th century approach to having a pet where it's like you're a useful thing that I find entertaining and like don't get in my way like you are gonna be in a cage you sleep on the floor you eat from the floor no being on the furniture no barking no talking you're on all fours all the time no using the bathroom no anything like that you are just being a pet literally as much as possible. And so that means no texting, no phone calls, no outside job, you don't leave the house, you don't do anything other than be a silent companion all of the time. Now, because these are stories written in the early aughts and the 90s, I'm not sure how much of this version of doing pet play is true, but I do think there are people that at least did this approach some of the time, where the goal was to be degraded and humiliated, and pet play wasn't something you chose to do because you liked being a pet, it was something you were forced to do because it pleased your partner or because they thought it was funny or because it would be the most humiliating thing that they could think of to do would be to force you to be a bad dog or a pig or a goat or something. And I think this approach is very much still alive in certain ways. There are definitely people who resonate with pet play through that humiliation and subjugation and not having any control over anything anymore, including being able to open doors or not. So it can be very extreme, but most people it turns out have jobs and vanilla friends and family and a life where they can't just like suddenly become a pet indoor chicken. I don't know why I chose that one, but I did. Just a pet indoor chicken 24 seven, starting from like when the mistress says so. Like most people aren't gonna be able to do that all the time. So this I think is very much an idealized fantasy most often, but again, some people do have this approach and they really like the strict, almost harsh discipline and protocol and being treated as though you are not human. You are not worth the same as a human being. And I, I will say, just for my own personal philosophy, I don't think you have to have this more speciesist approach to your pet play. You can both have a pet that is that way, not a bio pet, but like a human pet, where you are treating them as a pet, but not as though they are lower and lesser. So there's variety and shades to this. And just to make it very clear, all of this was typically done within a 24 seven, more high protocol DS or MS relationship. It was very much intertwined with doing some kind of DS. Now, with the more modern version of pet play that I think has become much more common over the last, I'd say probably 15 years or so, that is night and day from what I was just talking about. It is 
very different. They almost seem like different kinds of play entirely, though they are very much related. And this version of pet play, I don't want to give credit to like one group or one form or one person because it really depends on what type of pet play you're talking about. But within pet play, there was this transition from more writing focused places like live journal entries and blogs and things where everything was what was written down into this more visual form where you had FetLife, you had Instagram, you had other social media where you could share pictures of what you were doing. And I think seeing visually how pet play could look, that people looked cute when they were wearing a collar or ears or a tail or whatever, drinking out of a bowl. People went, oh, this can be a fun visual thing where I look cute or hot or whatever. It's not just like deep, dark, high level degradation all the time. Okay, this suddenly is now more approachable and it became more well known, I think through things like the BDSM test, which has included pets as far as I know, for basically the entire time the test has been around, which if you're like me, that probably led you to Googling more about it and researching it and suddenly you found both those older websites, but also people that were typically younger and wearing these cute pieces of clothing and lingerie and harnesses and collars, ears, tail, little like toe bean, paw pads and gloves and all of that. And it looked like something that was really cute and accessible and easy to do. But even within that, there was still an emphasis on it being part of a 24 seven relationship where it was something you were doing because you were submitting to your partner while you were doing it. But I'm gonna say something that if you were around at the time this happened, you might find a little bit controversial, but I'll say it. I feel like we said it was 24 seven, but we didn't really know what that meant. Like we were like, oh yeah, 24 seven BDSM. And the reason why I say that is because at the time, the air was very much like, oh, I have a 24 seven DS relationship. I call my partner daddy and he calls me kitten. And like, that's what it is basically. Like we just didn't really know yet. We were young. We didn't have experience. We didn't really know about the other conversations that had been ongoing at that point for decades about what DS was all about. We thought, oh, just like being somebody's kitten, that's like high level power exchange. And we were not having complex conversations in 2017 about how to make a long-term sustainable high level DS dynamic. We were just figuring it out as we went along and we failed and we tried, we succeeded sometimes. It was really a roller coaster of an experience, but there was still that pressure to have it be 24 seven. But what 24 seven meant was wearing a collar all the time, wearing ears all the time with every outfit, calling your partner a certain thing or wearing certain colors or outfits or things like that. Like it was much more superficial in its approach. And so I feel like we really got two endpoints of the spectrum. We had this one very extreme, hardcore, high level perspective. And then we had this very like, flouncy, pretty, superficial way of doing it. And I don't even say superficial to be clear. In a way, that means it's bad. Like, if you like the aesthetic of pet play, please do that. That's awesome. Support local and small kinky makers by ears and tails to your heart's delight. But I think that people overfocus on that and it makes it seem very hollow and again, superficial. And I don't think it has to be that way. And I think it, it's worth sort of like synergizing the two and meeting somewhere in the middle and finding how to get to that more sustainable place of intentional DS that is more than just dressing up, but doesn't necessarily mean that you're like licking crumbs off the floor every day or like pecking for insects in the yard, I guess, if you're a 24 seven chicken, like I mentioned earlier, but. Moving on from that analogy. And I have by no means covered the entire history of pet play here. There is a lot that I am leaving out, but it's a little bit of like a little bit of a bite-sized mini chunk of history for our analysis here. And I want to think about, okay, what can we take from this? What can we learn here 
to make more sustainable pet play? What does that look like with our current knowledge and our current perspective? And potentially maybe you are already seeing where I'm going with this based on how I have juxtaposed these two different approaches because both of them are very focused on how things look, how things appear to other people. And I don't think you get to sustainable long-term relationships based on things conforming to what you think they have to look like. I think the number one thing that is universal you can do to make 24 seven pet play happen is let go of your expectations of how you think that has to look. It does not have to look like sleeping in a cage under the bed every single night. It does not have to look like wearing a pet collar every single day or ears every single time you're around the house or anything like that. The aesthetic should be the last thing on your mind. Now, if again, you're doing this for the role play, different conversation. But if what you really want is to feel like a pet every single day, you don't have to look like a pet in order to be able to do that. The aesthetic, the ears, the color, everything else, that should be an accessory, a tool that you use to cultivate the headspace that you want to have. And actually what I've discovered over time is having these symbols on every single day, casually around the house, or even when I was filming videos a long time ago, that actually for me degraded how I felt about it. It didn't feel as impactful or important. It felt very mundane and I didn't want that. It felt like I was not really able to use them as ways to transition into a headspace I wanted. It was about visually telling other people that I was like a good, correct, proper pet player because look at what I was wearing and that didn't actually satisfy me. It did not reach my goal of making me feel like a pet. It felt like a performance and I wanted to stop performing. So do not get lost in thinking, oh, I gotta have this thing and buy that and buy this. And I've noticed over the last couple of years that I get far fewer comments on like where to buy gear. And I hope that means fewer people are focusing on buying the stuff instead of just actually doing the thing. So focus on not how you want to look, but what you want to do and what you are able to do. If you are somebody who lives with your partner and you work from home for 20 hours a week or something, you have a nice cushy tech job, you are going to be in a very different scenario than people who work 60 plus hours a week and share custody and have a long commute and are going to school part time or whatever else it is you got going on, you're gonna have to calibrate your expectations based on what you have available in your time tank for the day or for the week. Do not over promise, do not set yourself up for failure basically. It's perfectly acceptable to have things be remote or in voice notes or long distance with emails or texting or whatever else, find what works for you and take advantage of those small moments in time to be able to reconnect in your relationship. And I don't even really think the solution for 24 seven pet play is being able to have a list of like 10 rules you must have in order to be a proper pet. I think it's very individual and I think for some people, the rules and structure really, really work. And I think for other people, it's gonna be much more subtle. So I would also think about what do you get out of pet play? Do you like the costuming? Do you like the titles and the role play? Do you like feeling free and uninhibited and being able to explore and do what you want? Do you like the curiosity or feeling controlled, feeling like you don't have power, feeling like you are lower than someone else? Do you like feeling useful? Do you wanna be trained to do certain tasks? Do you like being naughty or silly or being punished? Or maybe it's something else entirely. Think about what you really, really like about pet play or if you don't know yet, think of maybe two to three key things you wanna explore and then figure out how to get those feelings from what you are planning to do in the relationship. And I actually came up with quite a long list of different activities. So I'm gonna go ahead and probably put those on the screen and just read from them because I have a lot of ideas for this. 
So for example, you could keep a pet related object in your person 24 seven, like a cat toy in your purse or a dog training clicker, or you might have a pet collar tag on your keychain or wear one on a necklace that is definitely more subtle than a collar and easier to have on you every day. So that way, when you are looking to get reassurance about your relationship, be reminded of your place, you have that right there very easily and it's not gonna raise any suspicions or lead to any kind of questions. You can also do things like use specific titles or pet names, especially if you have a dynamic where you have multiple different roles. You might want to have a headspace where sometimes your partner is master and then pet play time through daddy or you are slave so and so during regular time and then other times you are fluffy or kitten or whatever else. Getting more into things you can do and have around the house, I think one really key thing that I very much enjoy is you can have a special couch cushion or a floor seat or even an actual pet bed that you use as your pet bed in the living area just like you would with an actual animal that had a pet bed in your living room. And this is very easy to disguise if you have other pets around the house and if it's just like a couch cushion or a floor thing, very easy to explain away, but you know mentally, okay, this is my pet bed. I sit here because I'm not allowed on the couch or on the recliner or whatever because I am a pet. You can also do things like performing more pet-like acts of service, like getting a newspaper or the mail or getting shoes or something. You can do them on all fours if you want to, but you don't have to if you just wanna say, it's my job, I'm a pet, I get the mail for my owner. Like that's also totally fine as well. And if you like caretaking, you can do regular pampering or grooming appointments where you use either actual pet grooming mitts or a de-shedding tool or a brush or something in order to feel like your partner is grooming you as a pet. And this can be very fun to do, very relaxing as well, very connecting, where you feel like, okay, they're touching me, it's positive, and they are taking care of my nails or my brushing, making sure I don't have any matting, even brushing teeth as well. And that can be a way of accessing your pet headspace while also feeling taken care of and that your partner is doing something for you, you could not necessarily do for yourself. And it also does feel a little bit humiliating sometimes to have somebody else like brush your teeth too. So if that's your underlying motivation, definitely ways to tap into that here as well. And if you enjoy that and the D-type enjoys being in that caretaker position, you can definitely expand on this. Like maybe they're the ones who prepare the morning and evening meal or get you water because it's their job as the owner to feed and water the pets, right? Like you couldn't do that for yourself. And you can also connect that to a larger rule where you cannot open the pantry or the fridge without permission. Of course, be cautious with that one, but that can be something to expand into. You can take more standard kink related position training and turn that into a more kinky thing just by adding like a dog training clicker or calling things certain things you might within pet training like sit and lie down instead of like position one and position two. That can be very fun to do as well. And you can also train different things, right? You could also do responding to a whistle or a word or a hand sign. And especially with hand signs, those are really good if you wanna be able to do something subtle around other people without it necessarily being noticed or picked up on. And if you like service submission, you definitely have options here too. Like you can train tricks for your pets where they learn how to answer the door or make you coffee or return phone calls, right? Maybe more skills than a typical four-legged animal would have, but you're the very special one that somehow is able to do that and has thumbs. You can also do things like eye contact restriction or vocal restrictions as well, like essentially treat swearing like nuisance meowing or barking where your training go, shoot, don't bark, nip, quiet. 
<laughs> and that can be a fun way of both breaking a bad habit you maybe don't want to have and then also keeping that pet headspace. You can also take time to go on walks together or go to a park because it's taking your pet on a walk, even if they're just walking beside you normally, or you can't have rules about them having to follow one pace behind you to the left or to the right, or you can have some kind of bracelet you wear to symbolize a collar and a leash or some other kind of restraint you typically wouldn't actually put on a person in public. And please do not actually go around walking each other on leashes out in public. I beg you. But it can be a fun routine you do in the morning before work or when you get home in the evening before dinner to have that physical activity and that outside time to disconnect from electronics and just be together and be present. And to expand on that idea, you can have other ways and rules of how you walk together both on walks and more generally, right? Like, do they walk right next to you, beside you, in front of you, behind you, how far behind, how far ahead? Do you hold hands? Do you have a ritual you do where you approach each other? Like, what do you do when you start walking together? Again, subtle things if you want to be able to do this in public around other people, but there are lots of possibilities. Now, one example that I really like here is what I like to call enrichment activities, right? Like enrichment activities for horses or dogs or whatever, where you actually have a puzzle that you have to solve. That could be like an actual picture puzzle. It could be a dog or pet puzzle where they have to solve the puzzle using their sense of smell or nose to get to a treat or something. Those can be very fun to do as well as a regular part of your relationship. You can also just have regular old couch cuddles with lots of pets and verbal praise, or you can shower together and you can approach this from the perspective of like, it's not just like, ooh, intimate showering together. It's like a hot thing to do, but also because it's like, oh, I have to give you a bath because you're dirty and you're a pet and I have to be the one to bathe you. So your mindset does really affect how a lot of these things feel and you can choose to take them in a more pet focused way or not. And I think that's really up to you to keep that mindset in your mind when you are doing these activities. You can also do things like, for example, restrict behaviors that animals typically wouldn't be able to do, right? Like being able to use the restroom or opening doors or getting into the pantry or changing the channel on the TV or turning the volume down. You would have to then communicate your needs with maybe like a whinny or a whine or a meow and then leave it up to your partner to be able to decide what you actually need and then act on that. That can be a really fun thing to do for kind of like silly things around the house like the doors not open like please open it for me and he's like kind of whining about it, that can be very fun. It does get to a point where it can be more extreme and limiting, but it can also be more subtle and casual as well. And then I think it's also good to plan out time for things. If you're an adult with a busy life, you're not gonna have time typically to do everything you wanna do every single day, right? We don't always get full control over our schedule. So I think it's worth it to make time once a week or once a month for having focused pet play experiences, like wearing your gear or going to a mosh or just playing fetch inside your house. Take that dedicated time to get to be fully like a pet, even though on an everyday basis, you maybe aren't putting on the harness and ears. And then just on a final note, generally approach things with the attitude that the D-type is the one in charge and is knowledgeable and is the in control human. Whereas you are the S-type, you are maybe taking on more of the personality of the animal you are trying to reflect, right? Like being curious or loyal or mischievous or strong, but regardless, it's up to you to be more subordinate and look for guidance from the D-type, which is the human who knows more and all of that other stuff. And then if you get really stuck on ideas, you can always look to media for examples. Like there's a great pet play scene in Love and Leashes, maybe more than one. I feel like I remember one in particular, but there are media examples of this. I always think of like Chobits for some reason. And then also you have kind of the more general approach of like, I think it's Kenomo Mimi? Kenomo Mimi? I have no idea how that's supposed to be pronounced, but like the little like anime, cat ear, animal ear, people like those. Tons of examples of media that includes that for getting inspiration or ideas. And I think a lot of 24 seven pet play is much more like 
I'm a human pet with certain animal characteristics. Like I definitely found for me, when I was first into pet play, I thought I had to be like this very specific breed of dog on all fours and barking and never communicating outside of that. And I realized over time that actually kind of what fit me better in my style was having more of sort of this like human animal hybrid approach where I was a human pet with dog characteristics, not just like a full on all fours dog. Like I want to be like a dog girl, not a dog. You know what I mean? There's a difference between those two things. And knowing that really helped me develop what I wanted to do and kind of have that sort of like dog girl, cutesy, innocent, naive, made type, I guess is how I would describe it. And I think having that approach, we have a little bit of like a step between like regular everyday headspace and like full on, like on all fours pet headspace does make it more sustainable for most people in the longer term. And I think you'll notice that these suggestions I just gave, like almost none of them involve buying gear or doing anything expensive. Like pet play really is in your head. It's what you make it to be. And the point of gear is not to like make you be a pet. It can help you do that but it's a tool again. It's not the be all end all. If you like costuming, that's great, but you definitely do not have to have it. And I think feeling like you need to dress up to be ready to do something is not necessarily going to serve you in the long term. So those are just some of my ideas for 24 seven pet play. And there are tons of ways to adapt these ideas if you're in person together or long distance or close by, but you don't live together. If you have roommates, lots of variations on this. I would love to know your thoughts and ideas in a comment down below, especially if you do pet play and it has been a while since I've made one of these. I would love to hear your thoughts, any questions, comments, ideas you want to add. Please again, go ahead and do those in a comment down below. If you did enjoy this and you're not already, please do subscribe because I have videos twice a week about all sorts of different kink and beauty. DSM related content. And then finally, if you want to support what I do, the best way you can do is the Patreon. A link to that will be down below. If you do already support over there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.